वॉट हैपन्स अर्जुन इज आस्किंग कथम विद्याम अहम योगिम्स त्वाम सदा परिचिंतयन केशु केशु च भावेशु चिंत्यो से भगवन मया सो भावेशु इन द मटेरियल एक्जिस्टेंस हाउ कैन आई रिमेंबर यू एंड इन आंसरिंग दैट कृष्णा इंट्रोड्यूस द कंसेप्ट ऑफ विभूति सो बिफोर वी गोइंग टू विभूति ब्रॉडली स्पीकिंग देर आर टू वेज इन विच वी कैन रिमेंबर कृष्णा कैन कॉल दम एज इंटेंसिव एंड इंक्लूसिव इंटेंसिव मीन्स वी फोकस सोली ऑन कृष्णा Say like the sadhana is there. Say our hearing is there. So at that time we are focusing only on Krishna. It's intensive remembrance of Krishna, and then the inclusive Krishna remembrance of Krishna means while we are working in the world. So we are doing our services, we are doing our uh, family responsibilities, we are doing our professional obligations. We try to see Krishna in that situation also. So intensive and inclusive. So ma manusmara yudhya cha. Krishna is talking about a blend of both. So remember me and fight, but that doesn't mean remember me and fight means don't remember me when you are fighting. Rather, you cultivate remembrance of me so that when you are fighting, also you are remembering me. So there is intensive and inclusive. So in the Chatur Shloki Gita, Krishna has talked about intensive remembrance. Machitta madgata prana bodhyanta parasparam kathayanta shema nityam tushanti chera manti cha nityam they would love to do it constantly. Well, the world doesn't allow us to do Krishna katha constantly. There are so many other things which we need to do in the world. So Arjuna has to fight a war. So intensive is not even if it were possible for us, it's possible for us individually. Practically, it will not be possible because society requires us to do so many things. For most of us, the intensive will be too intense. Also, we cannot do it. <laughs> we like to hear a class for half hour, one hour, one and a half hours. Oh, okay, after that, yeah, you know what else can I do? <laughs> like that. So there is inclusive remembrance also. So then Arjuna has to practice inclusive remembrance while fighting. He has to remember. So this is where Krishna introduces the concept of vibhuti. Hmm? So let's see what is first. Let's try to understand what is vibhuti. So you could give a broad definition as vibhuti as the one above the many manifests as the one among the many. The one above the many is the supreme Lord. Hmm? And one among the many is some special empowered person in human society. So let's try to look at it. Uh, diagrammatically or visually so krishna exists above all living beings so he's one above the many now in the ma in the general mass of humanity there are some people who are special now different people may be special in different areas so somebody may be very powerful intellectually somebody may be very good intellect ma ma musically somebody may be excellent managerially so there are different people who stand out in human society so that capacity to stand out that is there in that person krishna says that is my vibhuti that is my vibhuti that how is that person able to stand out because they are manifesting a spark of my opulence so mama tejo amsha sambhava krishna says in 1041 so whenever we see somebody very intelligent very smart very fluent whatever it is that we are attracted to that one among the many represents the one above the many that is vibhuti so this so the uh, list that krishna gives in the bhagavad gita from 1020 to 1039 that is esha tuddeshatah prokto it is a indicative list it is not an exhaustive list is indicative not an exhaustive list why because this list can expand unlimitedly mm. expand unlimitedly so wherever there is anyone anything anyone anything or anyone opulent you see that as a manifestation of krishna and once shri prabhupada was traveling on a flight and there was a movie over there and the movie was there on the tv so at least during those times uh, there were like a common television for every passenger for all passengers nowadays tv means you have a tv for each passenger right in front of you <laughs> but there was this uh, that common television the uh, charlie chaplin movie was going on And Prabhupad was watching, and Prabhupad was laughing. And the devotee devotee is thought, "Is it the sense gratification?" <laughs> and <laughs> Prabhupad said that Charlie Chaplin's humor is a manifestation of Krishna's supreme humor. So Prabhupad was not just seeing Charlie Chaplin over there; he is seeing that okay, he has the capacity to make jokes. He is humorous. So where is he getting that humor capacity from? That is from Krishna. So Prabhupada was able to see that. Now that doesn't mean we should start watching Charlie Chaplin movies. <laughs> <laughs> But the point is, we can see Krishna everywhere. 
so when his uh, his holiness radhanath maharaj book i think journey home was written uh, it was at that time they got reviews from different uh, eminent people so in bengal they got a review from sauro ganguly so maharaj asked who is he so maharaj says he is a famous cricketer so maharaj said that at 500 years ago when mahaprabhu descended he descended as he actually took sanyas in the advaita sampradaya because that was what was respected at that time so if if the lord descends and can take sanyas in a sampradaya which is opposite to what is teaching he can do that much so he says if the lord descended now he would descend as a cricketer <laughs> <laughs> so you know at one level he says cricket is just a mass illusion well okay that's one way of looking at it but there are a lot of people who watch cricket and they're not just watching for entertainment people get inspiration from how cricketers perform how they play in difficult situations how somebody's character and determination comes out so it can be seen this mr rajasekh or tamasik or it, we can draw some sattvic lessons also from it so that that is the capacity to see krishna everywhere and this capacity to see krishna everywhere actually arises from a fundamental understanding of divinity so let's look at that understanding of divinity which krishna reveals so there is one conception of divinity is like a hierarchical conception of divinity hierarchical means there are many different living beings and there are they all in a hierarchy and the topmost at the hierarchy is krishna so now in some ways this hierarchical conception is correct we also talk about how the jiva manifests up to 50 qualities uh, we vishwa manifests 55 vishnu manifests 60 and krishna manifests 64 so that is indicative of the hierarchical conception but then we understand that krishna doesn't manifest only 64 qualities is anand gun sampann is un, is endowed with unlimited qualities so within an analytical framework we can say okay this is analysis where krishna has 64 qualities krishna has unlimited qualities and in one sense the, the krishna is not just the best of all beings in the hierarchical conception we think krishna is the best of all beings but krishna is not just the best of all beings he is the basis of all being basis of all being means nothing can exist without him no one can exist without him natasti vinayatsyan maya bhutam characharam nothing can exist so the hierarchical conception would mean like say i say if there is a there are team sports and there are individual sports they consider individual sports like tennis there is one player who is number one but if some other person player performs better and better they can displace and they can become number one so this is the hierarchical conception that was what hiranyakashipu had in mind he knew about the eternity of the soul but he thought because i am the soul and the soul is eternal i will perform tapasya lifetime after lifetime till one day i will become powerful enough to kill vishnu so that his idea is what is a hierarchical conception but that hierarchical conception is different from what we can call as a categorical conception categorical means that god exists in a different category of being and that is why when he asks vihara kashipu angrily asks prahlad that what is the source of your strength now prahlad is not just being cheeky in answering back to him prabhupada is actually giving him sorry, prahlad is giving him a deep truth what does prahlad maharaj say at the source of my strength is the same as the source of your strength and the source of the source of your strength and the source of your strength is brahma ji so now it is it is quite a quite outrageous thing to say to someone you know that okay how are you so strong he says you know actually even what to speak of my strength even your strength is not your strength you know in a sense is he just being uh, provocative he is not being provocative he is being educative he is trying to get hiranyakashipu out of this competitive conception you cannot compete with god because whatever you have for competing with god comes from god that's why <laughs> <laughs> so so he tells him that vishnu is not your enemy your only enemy is your uncontrolled and misguided mind which makes you think vishnu is your enemy so this is the categorical conception the categorical conception is that god exists in a different category of being and we jeevas can never enter that category of being so that's categorical difference
However, the Vedic understanding is not just God's categorical wisdom. That is the understanding of the Abrahamic religions. That God exists in a completely different category. And God is so different from us that there is no way we can even conceive God. In fact, that's why they have the, the in the one of the Ten Commandments is don't worship graven images. Why? Because God is so much other. God is so much different from us that there's no way to depict him. And therefore, any depiction is a falsehood. So that is the, that is why they are so much against idolatry. And Islam takes that even further. Islam is the concept of shark, where they say that depict associating God with anything material is the greatest sin. And according to them that Allah can forgive all sins, but he will never forgive the sin of idolatry. That's why they, are, they just can't comprehend the idea of deity worship. We may talk about the difference between idols and deities, but it just doesn't enter because it's a fundamental, it's almost like an irreducible difference between different between the traditions. So our understanding is, yes, God is categorically different, but God doesn't keep himself always different. God also descends as avatar. And so as you see over there, Krishna is existing in a different category, but whoever exists in this world, they are sustained by Krishna. Everybody in this world, whatever ability they have, that is provided by Krishna. So, this is, Krishna says, that means you are going to fight in the war, you will see different warriors, and you will see how powerful, how, how chivalrous Bhishma is, you will see how wise Drona is, you will see how excellent in archery Karana is. See their abilities as my vibhutis. So, we can see Krishna in this world also in this way. Remembering Krishna is not just turning away from the world and, oh, and remembering Krishna. Yes, that's important. Sometimes we have to do that. But remembering Krishna also means the capacity to see Krishna in the world. See Krishna in the events of the world. See Krishna in the people in the world. So, uh, so now with this, now if, if we say that, okay, Krishna should see even Karana's and uh, other Karana's ability as his vibhuti, then the question may come, then why should he fight against Karana? Isn't it? Why should he, if everything attractive in this world comes from Krishna? So then that is the difference. That is one reason Krishna talks about Daivi and Asuri. That the Abhu, there are many attractive things in the world. In fact, everything attractive comes from Krishna. But everything attractive doesn't take us to Krishna. <laughs> there is a difference. Everything attractive comes from Krishna. But everything attractive doesn't take us to Krishna. So, uh, how do we understand this? See, different people have different vibhutis. Different people have different vibhutis, but they also have their swecha, they have their free will. And some people may use their vibhuti to go toward Krishna and take others toward Krishna. Hmm? So, somebody has beautiful singing ability and they sing about Krishna. Hmm. Then, they are taking people toward Krishna. But somebody sings about mundane songs, sensual songs. They are simply spreading rajas. They are not taking people toward Krishna. We don't deny that their singing ability is very special. It is special, no doubt. But that singing ability, although it is a vibhuti of Krishna, it is not taking us toward Krishna. So everything attractive comes from Krishna, but everything attractive doesn't take us toward Krishna. So when somebody is exercising a vibhuti, exhibiting a vibhuti, we may get attracted and that's just natural. We human beings are naturally attracted to attractive, thing, to attractive things. But... We have to see what is the follow of this attraction. Is this vibhuti, this is attraction to this thing taking me toward Krishna or away from Krishna? And that same applies to our own abilities. We also have certain abilities. So are those, my ability, is it just filling me with ego so that I become proud? Or am I using this ability to serve Krishna, to go closer to Krishna myself and do things which I take others closer to Krishna? So let's try to understand this principle of how everything Attractive comes from Krishna, but everything attractive may not take us to Krishna. So you can conceive of this as a, say, there's an ocean. Sabaguna Sagar, Sabasukha Agar. What is that? Sabasukha Sagar, Sabaguna Agar, Krishna says that. Krishna is the ocean of all qualities, all happiness. So now, imagine there's a, there's a water body, like an ocean, and from there, like, there's a beach, and then it goes into a desert. Actually. So now there are drops of water along the path, of the, along the desert path. Now, all those drops of water have come from the ocean. But suppose, say, somebody is in the middle of the desert, where the place the middle drop is. And there, 
they start following the drop of water which is going away from the ocean. Then what will happen? They won't go, although the drop of water has come from the ocean, that drop of water won't take them towards the ocean. They have to follow the drop of water which is actually going towards the ocean. So similarly we can say, let's say everything attractive comes from Krishna. So you can see these three are Sattva Rajas Tamas. So there's a beauty of nature. Hmm? That comes from Krishna. So we are in a place like Govardhaniko village. It is so natural and so spiritual. Hmm. So I remember uh, there's quite a there's an atheist celebrity. So he went to a like a very eco-friendly community. See, the environmental consciousness is uh, is uh, is very much spreading in the world today. And there's a new reason for that. So he went to an eco-friendly community which is which is run by atheists. And he said, This place is so wonderful. You know, I can just peacefully never think about God. <laughs> he, he said that this cities are filled with these religious nuts. And you have to deal with them when you don't want to, you have to think about God. But in the in this village, there is nobody who talks about God. So I can peacefully never think about God. <laughs> so what is happening is Sattva is there, but Sattva is not taking them towards Shuddha Sattva. So there is, so depending on where we are and where we are going. So there is nature is attractive, wealth is attractive, even intoxication is attractive. Now, if it were not attractive, why would so many people become, addict, become addicts? So the point is all of these are attractive. But the question is, what is that attraction doing to us? So where are we and where are we going? So if somebody is simply alcoholic and simply is drinking and wasting their lives, then if they at least say, they think, okay, I need a better life. I want to take up a job. I want to earn some money. I want to be responsible. Then that is a step forward. They are making their life better. Hmm. So, um, you know, drugs is a big problem across the world. So the Scandinavian countries, uh, Scandinavian countries have been quite successful in overcoming drug addiction among their people. So what they did was, they stopped criminalizing drugs. Now, I'm not recommending this, but I'm illustrating a principle over here. That they stopped criminalizing drugs and they start focus on rehabilitating drug users. So they said that normally if somebody is a drug user, nobody wants to give such a person a job also. Because you, you may do something unpredictable in the, uh, or you may, have, you may peddle drugs over there. So they said that the government said, yes, these people are drug users. They are trying to reform. And if employers give a job to them, we will pay half their salary. So they help people get rehabilitated. And when that happened, what happened is that as people started living, doing something meaningful, they say it's ultimately meaningless, they're just tem temporary. But you know, instead of just wasting on life in drugs and uh, liquor, it's actually, okay, take up a job, do something responsible in society. That's better. And they found when they focus on rehabilitating people, then they were much more successful than simply penalizing drug users. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur actually says that, uh, that sometimes we just equate Rajas and Tamas and both are bad. He says Rajas is sometimes, uh, is, is sometimes useful as an antidote to the toxicity of Tamas. Tamas is, is means in a person is materially also not productive. It's terrible. But Rajas, at least a person is being materially productive. Then we think Rajas and Tamas are the same thing, but it's not. It's hugely different. Uh, most of us say we grew up with parents who had a lot of expectations from us. You know, study this, do this, do that. So generally Indians and Chinese, their parents are very expecting and demanding. So there are books about Indian Chinese parenting style written. There is one book called Tiger Mom. <laughs> the mom is like a tiger who is just who is so possessive, protective of the child. You know, don't do anything else. Just study, build a career. But but, you know, the, they, they, so they contrasted with uh, Western parenting, they call it squirrel mom. <laughs> <laughs> that the par Western parents, you just do whatever you want. You know, it's your life. So, so, so we may find sometimes our parents a little bit overbearing. Uh, but in one sense, it's far better than having parents who are completely negligent. If the parents are doing drugs and parents don't care of the children. And, oh, you study, you don't study. What is the big deal? It, it doesn't matter. So then, tamasic parents are actually far, far more toxic than rajasic parents. 
So, of course, Satvik parents are better and Shuddha Satvik are the best. <laughs> but the point is, from what is good and what is bad depends on where we are and where we are going. So, everything attractive doesn't take us to Krishna. Depending on where we are, something attractive may take us toward Krishna, something attractive may not take us toward Krishna. So, this is the overall understanding of the concept of Vibhuti. Now, what is the purpose of understanding Vibhuti? It is for redirecting our remembrance. That whatever naturally attracts our attention, that has the capacity to attract us. So, sorry, whatever as it, if it naturally attracts me, then what can I do? I can use this, I can see this as a spark of Krishna's all attractiveness. If I see this as a spark of Krishna's all attractiveness, then I can use it to reconnect with Krishna. To reconnect with Krishna. So I was in the Western world and I was, uh, I was talking with devotees after I had given a class. So one Mataji came to me and she said that how she she had become a devotee and she had, they had a, like a women's training ashram also. They were living there. And she said that I lived there for a year or so, but I was always very restless. And she, she said that she had grown up as an orphan. And she had been moved from one home to another home to another home. And the only thing she had, the steady thing in her life was a dog, a pet dog. So she said, when I was in the ashram, they said, no pets. So she says, I was longing for a dog, I was longing for a pet. And finally, I said, I cannot give up this longing. So that was my childhood. This was The dog was a shelter. So now she has, she has left and she has started her own shelter for orphan children. And there, so it has been found that for children who have been traumatized by some childhood trauma or something, letting them interact with pets is a very good way of soothing them, comforting them. So she has started this whole thing with pets, with the pet dogs who take care of, who, who care for or who, are, who comfort these traumatized children. And in that, she showed me pictures of her shelter and it's all filled with pictures of Krishna. You know, pictures of Krishna with Agasur and Bakasur and all those things. And so these children, they are in one sense interacting with dogs, but they are learning about Krishna also. Oh, what is the story? They learn about the story. So we may say, no, that if you love dogs, you won't love God. That is true at one level, but on another level, people are in a frame of reference where loving God is not in their picture only. So actually, in one sense, loving a dog is better than maybe just playing video games or surfing porn on the net or just compulsively being on social media or just feeling depressed and lonely and sorry for oneself. So one of the non-intrusive ways of dealing with depression, people say, is just adopt a pet. Now, I'm not advocating pets over here by any chance. I'm making simply the point that actually for somebody, Krishna's vibhuti may manifest through a dog. He said that the dog was a constant in my life. Somebody loves me. And now what has she done? She's using a dog and children's natural love for dogs to get people closer to Krishna. To get small children closer to Krishna. So that is the inclusive understanding of Krishna Bhakti. That everybody, you know, everybody may experience shelter, strength, attraction in different places. And instead of just simply dismissing it as mundane, we need to be able to say, actually, this is how they are seeing Krishna. Now, they may not know that they are seeing Krishna. But then it is for us not to dismiss their experience, but to help them see Krishna over there. And there's... Um, uh, there was a famous author, I think Oliver Wendell Holmes. So he, he wrote a letter to his friend and he said, I had a very productive morning today. I worked on one of my poems. He said, after breakfast, I added a comma. Before lunch, I deleted the comma. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the productive use of the morning. So he said, what is this removing one comma? But then he, during that time, what did he do? He actually recited the poem almost 500 times. Okay, which way does it sound better? Which way does it sound better? Now, why would somebody recite a poem 500 times? Well, they're experiencing something there. For most of us, we say they're just a waste of time. <laughs> but it is not a waste of time. Because for somebody who's an author, they're actually experiencing something higher over there. It is not just mundane. So our deepest experience is our experience of Krishna. 
even if we don't know it. A music a person who is doing music, they can just spend hours just trying to train themselves in music. Somebody who doesn't have that music, like, oh, what is this? You know, why do this take so much time? But no, they get immersed in that. So our deepest experience is our experience of the deepest reality. That is Krishna. But we may not know it. We may not know it. So it is for, uh, for the devotees to tell us. And when we encounter people like this, it is for us to tell them. There's a famous author who said that, and he was asked in an interview, you know, if you come to know that you are going to die in five minutes, what will you do? He says, I will type faster. I will type faster. He says, okay, I'm going to die, but writing is my life, it's my dharma. So I'll write more. Now we may say, this is mundane, you should remember Krishna. Well, yeah, that person doesn't know anything about Krishna. But they feel that the calling of their life is to write. So what are they doing over here? Actually, they're experiencing Krishna in that. Now, it, they may not, that's why if you see in the Krishna book, George Harrison introduced it and he wrote that everybody is attracted to Krishna. Some people know it and most people don't. But what does it mean? That means that whatever it is we are attracted to, actually it is an attraction to Krishna. So with this understanding, now let us look at, we look at how when somebody is attracted to some things, we can see it as a vibhuti. And we can try to spiritualize our vision of them and we can help them spare their spiritual help them spiritualize their vision of those things. So two things. We see somebody impressive rather than getting impressed only by them. We see them as they're, they're manifesting as Krishna's opulence. And if they are somewhat devotionally inclined, we try to help them uh, spiritualize that connection. But beyond that, now what about ourselves? What about ourselves? So we all have certain abilities and being able to see the gifts that we have been given. Now, trying to get a better self-understanding. That is not self-obsession. That is also a way in which we learn what Krishna has given us. What Krishna has given us. So if you want to holistically connect with Krishna, there are two aspects. There is Ma Manusmara and there is Yudhacha. So Ma Manusmara is our inner connection with Krishna. And Yudhacha is our outer contribution for Krishna's service. In Krishna's service. And Krishna wants Arjuna to do both. The inner connection and the outer contribution. And now, what will be the balance? That may vary for different people. Not everybody may want the same level of inner connection. Some people may be more outward oriented. And for them, the outer connection is more important. But that connection should also be taking to Krishna. For some people, they are more, more internally connected. So, this is a holistic, and this is a pragmatic and a personal balance. It is not someone, something which others can tell us. This is how you have to balance. It is based on our position in society and our disposition, the particular swabhava that we have. So this is this is what we can strive for. Now let's try to understand this from another framework now. That, see, there are now, these are terms which I'm using in English. So there is self-actualization and there is self-realization. So self-realization -realiz generally means what? That which is a reality, I understand it to be a reality. That's a realization. Hmm. Actualization is that which is potential, I make it actual. That which is potential, I make it actual. So for us to, to holistically grow, both self-actualization and self-realization is required. Self-actualization means Krishna has gifted our body and mind with certain abilities, certain interests. And we need to discover that, develop that and use them to contribute in the world. That is self-actualization. Now, Arjuna's name, Gudakesha, comes from two reasons. One is because of his devotion, he had conquered his sleep. The other is due to his diligence to archery, he conquered his sleep. Now, his guru will teach him how to shoot and all night practically, Arjuna would be practicing. That is also Gudakesha. So, both aspects are there. So, Arjuna discovered his archery skills and he developed it. So, when they say improve body and mind, it doesn't, doesn't mean just look, look better. It's, that's very superficial. Improve body and mind means manifest the potentials that are there in our body and mind. That is self-actualization. So self-actualization and self-realization. Both are required. The Bhaktivinoda Thakur's dream of a Krishna conscious world. What was that? He didn't say, that is, he said that at one level he said that when will people from all over the world come? And at Mayapur Dham they will say, Jai Shachinandana Gaur Hari. That was one aspect of his dream. But another was, says, when will the high court judges 
be weary vaishnav tilak now what does that mean how is that going to happen now one way is that the krishna consciousness has spread so much that we have a krishna conscious government and the krishna conscious government appoints krishna conscious judges hmm well that's one way but whether the prabhupad said i won't be the king i'll be the guru of the king isn't it even if we have a krishna conscious government you know our devotees going to manage the whole world we find it difficult to manage our own movement isn't it <laughs> so no it, no i'm not it's not a joke actually what i'm saying is that management is a very difficult thing the devotees who are doing management are doing a great sacrifice and service it is not easy and there are some people who have that vibhuti no it's not that devotees automatically get every vibhuti necessarily so that somebody is, so the one way could be that uh, that the whole world become krishna conscious and then we have krishna conscious judges also another way could be that devotees become so competent in their fields that the secular government has no hesitation in appointing devotees to highly respectable places so bhakti no thakur is himself an example of that he was a pioneer at that time not many indians so racism was very much there imperialism more specifically but bhakti no thakur one of the few people who was a was a, a high was a district magistrate at that time which is more or less equivalent to a high court judge so that is also one way that means the gifts that we have been given we we actualize them we manifest them fully so that is so we self actualization and self realization both are required for holistic development <clears throat> so now self actualization to understand it uh, so one example could be that it is as i said it means to make the potential actual so if somebody has been given a seed it might be a precious seed Uh, but that seed alone is not enough the seed has to be nurtured it has to be developed then it will give a rich harvest mm-hmm. if if somebody is farming now with monsanto and other kind of these commercialized brands coming up they want to destroy all traditional seeds and then seeds people have to purchase and it requires a lot of money to purchase them so seeds are not a small thing they are very valuable so all of us have certain seeds of talents interests which krishna has given us now it is for us to find what seeds we have and it is for us to develop them that is self actualization so prabhupad was in england and uh, one rochan prabhu he asked prabhupad all england was london was at that in the headquarters of uh, of uh, europe for us so they were from germany from france from netherlands all of them were coming and they were telling the reports and he rochan prabhu i met rochan prabhu in alachu when i had gone also he told me the same story incidentally he told the story after he came a little late for the class so in the class i had spoken that story and then in the comments he spoke the same story again <laughs> it was nice he spoke with great devotion mm-hmm. for me it's just one past time of prabhupad but for him it is the most treasured remembrance of his life so he said that he asked he felt that everybody has something to do for krishna so for for, for prabhupad he says but i don't have anything so he went to prabhupad and asked prabhupad what can i do for you and prabhupad said what do you want to do for krishna he says prabhupad whatever you do whatever you do i'll do he says no what do you want to do for krishna he thought is this a test because here when you going to want your want is your independence your material desires give it up is this a test no prabhupad whatever you want i'll tell you i do for krishna prabhupad became very grave he says understand your philo- understand our philosophy he said find out what you want to do and do it for krishna find out what you want to do and then do it for krishna now this is not the full philosophy of krishna consciousness of course there's much more but prabhupada is talking here about how each of us has to take individual responsibility for developing the gifts that krishna has given us it's like say if our parents leave us some inheritance maybe and it is in the in the backyard of our house dug somewhere and we just neglect it and that was meant for us it get wasted so krishna has given us abilities interests so why is he given it it's not meant to be wasted so that self actualization is like a seed which we have been given we develop it that's one aspect and that is the basis of our social contribution and then there is self realization self realization is to recognize the reality of who we are see ultimately we can't base our identity only on self actualization 
somebody may become somebody may become a great musician a great author a great political leader but ultimately what are they going to do what are they going to achieve you know it is that i write a few uh, writing is one of my main services so i have read quite a few books on writing read about writers mm. so so in the last century out of the 10 top authors seven of them actually committed suicide and now I, i mean i was a little shocked when i read that but then i found out what actually happened so it is is that see for a person is we all have a innate calling for progress now we want the future to be better than the present and we want that we play a part in bringing that better future that we can play a part whether it is our own family our own health our society our movement our youth center whatever it is you know, what makes us wake up every day is the hope that i can make tomorrow better than today or to- today better than yesterday that's that's innate to the living condition but what happened to these authors is that they wrote a landmark book which is their these are top authors means their books are considered to be top books in the uh, in the whole say, uh, century but what happened is even authors know that there is something mysterious something like inspiration that comes and that's when you write now in modern cycle modern uh, workplace wisdom they talk about flow they talk about various words like that but it is almost as if something beyond you takes possession of you and does things to you this is true in every field but especially in creative fields it is all the more true so what happens is they write a stunning book and then there is a pressure of that expectation when they write the next book and when they write the next book it just doesn't it just doesn't look that good it's not that good and then so one of the authors in her suicide note she wrote that i cannot bear to live with the idea that my best is behind me not ahead of me that my best is behind me not ahead of me that i already done the best work and i will never be able to write anything which is as good as what i had written so what has happened over here is yeah as you grow older uh, if uh, one of my friends is doing his uh, is american the upcoming devotee is doing his phd in the post celebrity lives of sportsmen that then is sports is a career which peaks very early but generally it's like if you are 35 or 40 you're like a dinosaur in sports isn't it it's it's a career which peaks very early and the same applies to other glamorized careers like say hollywood or bollywood so generally unless somebody can get a change their role from a hero to the parent of a hero <laughs> they can't continue very easily so what happens is after people have achieved that fame if they achieve that fame then to to go from celebrity to anonymity it is very very difficult so when people get depressed it is not just that the career is caused cause depression what has happened is in that in that adve- krishna says jayosmi vyavasayosmi krishna says i am adventure i am victory so when they achieve when a sportsman achieves something special when a movie star achieved fame in some ways they are experiencing krishna over there but that fame has come and gone and now what is next what is next after that well if there is nothing then you just can't live they can't live because once having now they may not know that they experience krishna but actually they have experienced a glimpse of krishna and they can't settle for ordinary life after that it's only when they can reinvent themselves they may make cricketers become cricket commentators or something like that they they have to settle for a less high profile identity and only if they can settle for that then can continue with their lives so one author uh they wrote in their book about how they overcame the suicidal urge i said that i realized that for me the real strength was not just in being read it was in just writing just writing so that requires maturity to realize so but the point i'm making over here is that for self actualization alone is not enough even if one succeeds fully in a phenomenal way one becomes a person becomes an international celebrity one becomes one of the most influential people of the whole century but still that is not enough the soul will still long for krishna so self actualization has to be balanced with self realization otherwise it will not be fulfilling not only will it not be fulfilling rather because one has experienced the high of self actualization then one will have a low and it will be a very painful low 
if one doesn't know how to psychologically cope with it, it will be very, very difficult. So that's why self-actualization and self-realization, both are required. And for all of us, we may have different degrees of talents. So when we actualize ourselves in the sense that we develop our abilities, now some of us may be like Hanuman who can do lots of wonderful things for Krishna. Some of us may be like squirrels. But the key thing is, we need to understand that our satisfaction comes, we will get satisfaction not by getting a bigger part, but by doing our part better. Not by getting a bigger part. If the squirrel tries to become like Hanuman, the squirrel is never going to become like Hanuman. But the squirrel can be the best squirrel in the service of Lord Ram. So not getting a bigger, bigger part, but doing our part better. And that is where sometimes our in, in, in bhakti, what happens is, we may not use the word self-actualization, but we also do a lot of services. You know, we may preach, we may distribute books, we may cultivate new people to come. And some devotees seem to be so talented. You know, they are extremely good in studies, they are extremely good in public speaking, they are extremely good in cultivation. And then we feel like, I am nothing in front of them. And then what happens is, that creates insecurity. That creates uncertainty and then that creates instability within us. So, the point is that, yes, they may, be, they may be preaching a lot. They may be able to get a lot of people to come to Krishna and that's wonderful. But, just their ability to get a lot of people to Krishna is not what is going to take them to Krishna. It is how they are turning their heart toward Krishna. That is what is going to take them toward Krishna. So, for us, in one sense, our service is also our means to connect with Krishna. So, yes, some of us may be empowered to be like Hanuman, but if we are empowered to be only like a squirrel, that doesn't mean that we are that we are going to be neglected by Krishna. No. Krishna's circle of love includes every one of us. Whether our service is small or large. So we some people may have been given a very great vibhuti. We might have been given a very small vibhuti. But from the in the world's eyes, our vibhuti may be small. But that small vibhuti is enough for us to contribute in according to our capacity and it is enough for us to connect with Krishna. So generally, if we don't understand this principle, if we start seeking a bigger role rather than doing our role better, that is when self-actualization self, uh, will come in the way of self-realization. That means we'll say, oh, why spend so much time on chanting? Why speak do sadhana? Why do this? Why do that? I just want to do more service. Why? It's not just so that I can get more people and I won't call it it's just ego, you want to be famous. No, it's actually, it's, it's insecurity. I want a sense of identity. I want a sense of self-worth. And if you're a devotee community, where do we get our self-worth from? If you're getting it externally, it's from how much our services are recognized. And to get it internally from our connection with Krishna is going to take a lot of time. So we, it's, this is not just an individual responsibility, but it's also a community's responsibility that you know, how much are we valuing devotees who may not be doing a lot of visible services? So I was once, I'll conclude this point, that I was once with Jayadwait Maharaj. And uh, one devotee asked him, Maharaj, what gives you faith in Krishna consciousness? So Maharaj said that, you know, every last 25 years I've been going to Vrindavan. And every year I go over there, I see this one elderly brahmachari. He serves Charanamrut every day. And he says, seeing him serving Charanamut every day gives me faith in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> now, what did he mean by that? He meant that, you know, yes, you may say, oh, there are thousands of people becoming devotees, there are so many temples, so many people are practicing, that gives me faith. Well, that that's also can give us faith. But the fact that this devotee is able to continue this small service of serving Charanamut year after year, that means they are getting some higher taste. That means the taste in serving Krishna is real. And that is faith in Krishna consciousness. That is the ultimate faith in Krishna consciousness. If you are only going to see how many people are becoming devotees as the basis of our faith, well, then you may say far more people are maybe becoming a follower of this, this guru and this cult and this, this group and that group. That can't be the basis. So for us, we both as an individual and as a community, you know, we en encourage everyone to balance the self-realization and self-actualization. That we develop the gifts that Krishna has given us and we ultimately realize ourselves as souls. And that is the balance, Maam Anusmar Yudhyacha, that Krishna tells Arjuna to do. So seeing the Vibhuti is one way 
like Krishna tells that you can you have to function in the world, but that doesn't have to be simply mundane consciousness. There can also be Krishna consciousness. So I'll summarize. I spoke initially about the 17 questions on the Bhagavad Gita, and we did a quick overview of the Bhagavad Gita there, and then I focused on the concept of vibhuti. So there I took four main points. First was introduce the concept of vibhuti itself. What is that? The one above the many manifests as the one among the many. So Arjuna, when he has to fight, he can see the extraordinary abilities of the warriors on the opposite side also as manifestations of Krishna. And in that connection, you talk about the hierarchical and the categorical conceptions of divinity. God is not just the best of all beings, he's the basis of all being. Then the second point you talk about is that everything attractive comes from Krishna, but everything attractive doesn't take us to Krishna. So we, based on where we are, we have to see what will take us toward Krishna and what is away from Krishna. And so we will be able to see anybody who is attracted, anybody who has anything attractive, we see that their attractiveness is coming from Krishna. And if they are attracted to something, their deepest experience is their experience of Krishna. And we need to help them connect with that, connect that experience with Krishna. I give the example of the dog and how through the dogs one can experience Krishna and help others experience Krishna. And then the last point was this balance of self-actualization and self-realization. So self-actualization means that we understand some vibhuti of Krishna has, Krishna has given to me also. And I, it's like a seed which I need to develop. And only when I develop it, then I can contribute. And at the same time, while it is, it is important to self-actualize, understand and develop our talents, but that alone is not enough. Because even if we succeed in doing that, succeed in the world's eyes, but still that is not our vibhuti, that is Krishna's vibhuti. So, we may be able to do wonderful things once, but we will not be able to repeat it. So, if somebody, say, authors become suicidal because, celebrity authors because, I can't live with the thought my past is behind, my best is behind me, not ahead of me. So, they experience Krishna and they don't know how to experience Krishna through their self-actualization anymore. So, that's why we need self-realization also. And so, self-realization, when we do, then we connect with Krishna internally. Then we will understand that our real satisfaction will come not just in getting a big, bigger part, but in doing our part better. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you.